What do you picture when I ask you to think of space? I imagine some of you might picture a beautiful galaxy. Maybe you think of an astronaut standing on the moon. Or maybe you picture some of our planets, maybe the iconic rings of Saturn. But when I think of space, I see something completely different. I see the satellite data that helped a farmer in Brazil grow the coffee in this cup. I see the tracking data that tracked this coffee as it traveled across the Atlantic Ocean. I see the map that told me where I could stop en route today to get my coffee. I see the weather forecast that told me that I was going to have to bring an umbrella today. And I see the backbone of our banking industry that meant that I could pay for this coffee with just a tap of my wallet. And when you leave here today, I want you to see what I see. I want you to see that space is all around us, and it touches every aspect of our lives. Now, I do think it's fair to say that for a long time, space was the realm of an elite few. The astronomers, the astronauts, the rocket scientists. And there's a good reason for that. Space travel is really, really hard. As soon as we build a spacecraft and send it up into space, if something goes wrong, we can't just send an engineer up to fix it. So we have to be sure that every spacecraft that we build is going to work perfectly every single time. And so to do that, what we would do is take a long time over the design. We would try not to change too much as we built our spacecraft. And we would make sure that we always used tried and tested technologies. And for a long time, this worked really, really well. We have carried out some incredible space missions, many of which have lasted longer and achieved more than we would ever have thought was possible. But there is a downside of this way of working. Let me tell you about MBSAT. NVSAT was a European Space Agency mission that was launched in 2002 to study our world. It sent back the beautiful images that you see behind me. It studied our land, our oceans, and our atmosphere, and taught us more about our world than we had ever known before. So NVSAT was an incredible mission. But it was also a huge mission in more ways than one. The NVSAT spacecraft itself was about the size of a bus and weighed eight tons. It took 10 years to build and launch, and it cost about 2 billion euros. Now, you would think that for that kind of money, we would be getting cutting-edge, top-of-the-range technology. And yet, when NVSAT launched in 2002, it was using tape recorders on board for storage. And to put that in perspective, in 2002, we were seeing the first USB memory sticks on the shelves here on Earth. And so because of this need to use tried and tested technologies, NVSAT was already years out of date by the time it launched into orbit. And by the time it sent back its last images in 2012, the technology on board was decades out of date. So yes, NVSAT was an incredible mission. But it just makes me wonder, imagine what NVSAT could have achieved in 2012, if it had had 2012 technology. And what's really interesting is that it was actually this miniaturization of technology, the USB sticks, the SD cards, that would end up disrupting the space industry forever. Groups of professors and students in the USA realized that by cannibalizing parts out of their mobile phones and their laptops, they could build spacecraft that were smaller and cheaper than anything that had come before. Some of them, like this one here, small enough to hold right in your hand. And sure, they weren't as reliable as the big spacecraft that we had traditionally built, but it didn't matter because these spacecraft had their own unique advantages. The first thing that made these spacecraft so incredible was that they were so quick to build. So where NVSAT took 10 years to build and launch, these small spacecraft could be built in less than 12 months. 
So now the technology that we were sending into space could actually be up-to-date, cutting-edge technology. The second big advantage of these spacecraft was that they were so cheap. So suddenly, developing countries who for a long time had to rely on agencies like NASA and the European Space Agency to get their space data, suddenly they could build their own bespoke missions. They could send spacecraft up to monitor their economic growth, plan their urban expansions, predict their farmers' yields, and even to support their people as they responded to disasters like flood and fire. And the third thing that made these spacecraft such incredible game changers was that they were so small and light. And so instead of building one huge spacecraft to send into space, we could send lots of little ones. Now, to explain to you why we might want to send lots of spacecraft into space, I'm going to have to give you a tiny little lesson in astrodynamics. But don't worry, because it's not as complicated as we'd like to have you believe. And in fact, to start, I'm actually going to teach you first about the wonderful Glasgow subway system. Now, for anyone who's not familiar, the Glasgow subway system is an incredible piece of engineering. It consists of two concentric rings of tracks. On one, the trains go clockwise. On the other, the trains go anti-clockwise. And all of the trains stop at all of the stations. So it's fantastic if you have no sense of direction because you absolutely cannot get lost. Now, Imagine that there's only one subway car on one of these tracks. If you turn up at the station and just miss that train, then you have to wait for that car to come the whole way back around again before you can take your journey. But if there's more subway cars on the line, then you don't have to wait as long to take a trip. And it's exactly the same in space. When we launch a spacecraft up into space to look down at our Earth, we put it into a circular or oval path around our Earth that we call an orbit. And as the spacecraft travels around its orbit, the Earth rotates underneath it. And this is fantastic, because what that means is that with one spacecraft in one orbit, we can see anywhere in the world. But the downside is that once our spacecraft has passed over a point on the Earth, it might take days or even weeks before it'll fly over that location again. But just like the Glasgow subway, the more spacecraft that we have in orbit, the less time we have to wait for a spacecraft to come overhead. And in fact, if we had enough spacecraft in orbit, we'd be able to see anywhere on Earth at any time. Now, I know what you're going to ask next. Isn't it going to get crowded up there? And the sad truth is that it already is crowded up there. So yes, space is really, really big, but our little orbital neighborhood is starting to get busy. We've already seen the first spacecraft collisions. In 2009, two spacecraft smashed into each other, shattering into more than 2,000 pieces, which are now flying around the Earth, some of which are going to stay in orbit for more than a century. And the more spacecraft that we put into orbit, the greater the chance that these type of collisions are going to happen. Now, there is something that we can do about this. If we put our spacecraft into orbits that are close to the Earth, there's a little bit of atmosphere left there. And so as our spacecraft moves around the Earth, it crashes into little molecules of the atmosphere. And these slow it down until eventually it spirals down towards our Earth, burning up in the lower atmosphere. There's a natural spacecraft removal service. Now, if you've spent 2 billion euros and 10 years building your spacecraft, you probably don't want to put it somewhere where it's going to burn up in three or five years. But if you've spent 12 months and 10,000 euros building your spacecraft, then maybe you don't mind if it deorbits in three years or even in one year. In fact, maybe it's even an advantage, because once that spacecraft deorbits, you can replace it with a new one that has new, up-to-date technology on board. So you can make sure that the data that you're getting from space is always the best that it can be. So yes, there is an argument to say that these small spacecraft could contribute to our growing space debris problem. 
but I think they can also be a part of the solution, as long as they are used sustainably and responsibly. And that's really the question. We've seen it here on Earth. When corporations have to choose between profitability and sustainability, they don't always make the choice that we would like them to make. And so it's up to all of us to ensure that the companies, agencies, and governments that are operating in our space environment are doing so responsibly. And the only way for us to do that is for us to stop seeing it as the realm of an elite few and start seeing it as a shared space for all of us. And the truth is that thanks to these small satellites, space really is more accessible and open and closer than ever before. Today, you can buy a small satellite like this one for as little as $5,000. And you can launch it into orbit for as little as $1,000 a kilogram. If these reductions in price that we've seen continue, then by the year 2040, it could be possible to buy and launch your own spacecraft for the cost of a high-end mobile phone today. And just think, universities, high schools, societies, even individuals like you could all buy, build, and launch your own spacecraft. Now, if you had a spacecraft of your very own today, there's probably not an awful lot that you could do with it. But that's the great thing about these small spacecraft. There's strength in numbers. Imagine if you had your own spacecraft that was part of a global network of spacecraft all working together. Each spacecraft might have its own individual task. Some might take images of the Earth. Some might measure rainfall. Some might predict the weather. Some might even look away from the Earth, searching for new planets or hunting for extraterrestrial life. But whatever these spacecraft are doing, all of the information that they gather would be shared with every other spacecraft in the network and would be made available to everyone. Just imagine what we could do with all of that information. We already use satellite data for so much. Farmers use satellite data to predict their crop yields and to plan the sustainable growth of their farms. Forestry commissions use it to plan their sustainable logging and to prevent illegal logging. Fisheries use it to monitor fish stocks, prevent illegal fishing, and even to protect against piracy. But I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Imagine what we could do if anyone in the world could have access to all of this data and so much more. And that's really what I want to ask you today. If you could have your very own spacecraft, if you could be a part of this global network of spacecraft, if you could have access to all of the information about anywhere in our planet at any time, what would you do? Would you use it to find the best surf for your next weekend away? Would you use it to find the best snow for your next ski holiday? Would you use it to monitor the global fashion industry to make sure the clothes that you're buying are being manufactured ethically? Would you use it to work out what the carbon footprint of your avocado toast really is? Or would you do something completely different? Would you do something that no one has even thought of yet? Would you do something that only you can do? Something that could change the world? Thank you.